Biology of Genomes Conference PECBIO virtual workshop. My name is Jonas Korlach. I'm Chief Scientific Officer, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'd like to tell you about all things um, new and updates about PECBIO, in particular, how HIFI sequencing can be used for a better understanding of the biology of genomes. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, um, uh, Michelle Vieira, who will tell you all about the plant and animal science uh, space, and then uh, Dr. Aaron Wenger, who will uh, cover the human market. I would like to start with the product updates and uh, also talk to you about the latest in terms of uh, COVID sequencing. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, PECBIO is a leading provider of complete and accurate long read sequencing. And through our instrumentation of the SQL 2E and associated consumables, we provide solutions to the scientific community in all areas of genomics, whether it be genome assembly, detecting all variant types, targeted sequencing, long read RNA sequencing or isoseq uh, or metagenomics. Uh, the value of PECBIO data has now been demonstrated in well over 8,000 peer reviewed publications. And most recently, the adoption and enthusiasm has centered around HIFI reads, which are sequencing reads that are both long and highly accurate. This unique characteristic leads to best in class performance in many areas. And what we'd like to do in this workshop, give you some examples of how this has been employed by the scientific community. You likely also know how HIFI reads are generated. Uh, very briefly, the polymerase reads in PEC biosequencing have become so long now certainly well over 100 kilobases to allow for building consensus from multiple passes on a smart belt template, leading to hi-fi reads that are typically 15 to 20,000 bases in length and are 99.9% .9 or greater in accuracy. On the right, I compare the read accuracy distributions of the three major sequencing technologies. And you can see that PECBIO hi-fi reads are very close to Illumina reads are extremely accurate, over 99.9%. This is in contrast to other long read sequencing technologies that are much less accurate. Secondly, the HIFI read distribution is very narrow, which makes the bioinformatics much easier and much faster because the algorithms can assume this very narrow range of high accuracies. This also is very different compared to other long read sequencing methods. In addition to the extraordinary accuracy, HIFI reads provide other advantages, such as even coverage, high genome completeness, allele resolution, and long range phasing. All these aspects taken together result in superior performance with respect to the calling of all variant classes. Indeed, both the recent Precision FDA Truth Challenge version 2, the Genome in the Bottle 0.6 benchmark, and included here are the most recent updates for all the different technologies highlighting that PEC bio hi fi data have the best performance and with substantially lower variant calling errors in SNPs, indels, and structure variants compared to all other sequencing technologies. Uh, recently, we released an update of both a sequencing chemistry and software. So this is the hi fi sequencing and software version 10.1 release, which includes new consumables, a new enzyme, a new polymerase that is faster, going around the smart belt um, faster and thereby improving the HIFI uh, data quality. We worked uh, to reduce the DNA input requirement, um, reducing it to a minimum input um, genomic DNA in, uh, requirement of now five micrograms. And this was done in collaboration with um, the researchers at Children's Mercy Kansas City, um, who have been uh, uh, partners of ours for quite a while now, um, and they would like to use the technology for uh, solving uh, rare disease cases, explaining rare disease cases, and Aaron will talk a little bit more about that. But with regard to the workflow, uh, there's now an efficient and scalable HIFI library construction workflow, um, which allows many samples to be processed in parallel and thus removing, removing a potential bottleneck for the sequencing. And this includes all the steps from starting with DNA now as low as five micrograms, through shearing, library prep, size selection, and sequencing, either using a multi-channel pipetter protocol or for even more samples of fluid handling automation. And so this significant reduction in DNA input requirements by 65% um, to five micrograms opens a wider variety and volume of samples. For example, from blood, lower volume pediatric samples, tissues with regard to biopsies and limited DNA samples, for example, from biobanks. 
I would like to remind that in addition to the standard hi-fi sequencing with five micrograms that I was just talking about, we also have different solutions for even lower DNA input. A low DNA input sequencing protocol with 300 nanograms per gigabase of genome size. And then most recently, the ultra low DNA input sequencing, which is um, including amplification. However, it allows samples to go as low as five nanograms of DNA input um, to um, uh, be addressed. Um, so this can be either very small uh, animals or, or needle biopsies, for example. Um, we also have workflow improvements with the new release um, with regard to an instrument control software, including ways to optimize and um, uh, help with the loading of the smart um, uh, cells. And then lastly, and, and I want to remind um, uh, just briefly that with the introduction of the SQL 2 e system about six months ago, the um, HIFI reads have uh, including now a dramatic reduction in the data cost. The demands on data storage, transfer, and compute are dramatically reduced to levels of 70% to 90% reductions and with cloud computing as an option. And so this results in a compute cost savings of over tenfold um, of the SQL 2 e system relative to the SQL 2 system. And lastly, uh, there's support now for the SARS-CoV-2 analysis uh, in SmartLink version 10.1. And I'd like to spend a few moments about this because um, obviously this is still uh, a big problem. And so I, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about both surveillance and research in terms of coronavirus genome sequencing. Uh, because uh, with the emergence and the rapid spread of these uh, coronavirus variants that we've seen, the urgent need to better detect and track these variants has been recognized and prioritized. And of course, genomic sequencing is the core methods for this and for establishing a robust COVID surveillance network. We've been very privileged to work with the researchers at LabCorp starting about a year ago to develop a high throughput workflow for complete SARS-CoV-2 viral genome sequencing. And the analysis for this workflow is now embedded in SmartLink. LabCorp then received a contract from the CDC uh, last year to apply this pipeline for a large scale longitudinal genomic survey that aims to improve the understanding of these mutations, how they're transmitted and how the public health response to these mutations can be improved. Through this program, the CDC has greatly increased the rate at which it conducts genomic sequencing of the COVID-19 virus and about half of the CDC contracted samples were sequenced with PecBio in the first quarter of this year, as you can see in the graph on the left in blue. The protocol is available through our website and it can pool up to 900 samples per smart cell that can be sequenced on the SQL2 or SQL2e systems. One of the advantages of long and accurate sequence reads for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing is shown here. Through full-length hi-fi sequencing of the longer amplicons, these variants are automatically phased over longer distances thereby allowing the confident identification of two distinct subtypes in this particular example. This is something that would not be possible here with the shorter Arctic amplicons. In addition, because each HIFI read is extremely accurate, coverage of only a few reads is sufficient to very confidently obtain a high quality consensus and make these variant calls. And this also helps with pooling and amplicon balancing in the protocol. I'd like to talk a little bit about how the community has used biosequencing and these capabilities for research. Um, this is a paper by researchers from the NIH, Eli Boritz, um, and colleagues on tracking the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 within infected individuals and looking for mutations and minor variants and quasi-species that arise. In the figure on the left, you can see that uh, you, in this uh, work, um, uh, a segment of the genome of in, in excess of five kilobases was sequenced. And um, it could be understood then through PEC biosequencing, uh, the recurrence of the virus titer. So in the um, image on the upper right, you see that initially the virus titer was very high, then went down, but then came back again. And this was um, co-occurring in conjunction with the emergence of these uh, minor variants that you see here in purple and blue, allowing for the quantification, for the phasing and the confident identification of these um, multi-mutation uh, subtypes. And again, this would not be possible. You need both the read length and the accuracy to make these types of determinations. 
This is a very busy slide, um, but um, I think a very exciting work in a preprint by uh, Chia Lin Wei and colleagues from Jackson Laboratory showing the, uh, the true transcriptome and pr uh, resulting proteome diversity of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what they found is that in the upper right image, you see that symptomatic individuals, so people who get sick, have a much greater, this is on a log scale, abundance of these subgenomic RNA fragments that are, uh, result from misprocessing and misplicing. And so with um, the isoseq method, it's possible to confidently characterize this entire complexity of all the different RNA molecules that are being generated. And on the right, you can see this uh, complexity and then in the pie charts, how that relates to what really happens to the proteome of the virus and how it might relate to the um, uh, disease causing uh, effects in the individuals. And then lastly, PAC biosequencing has been used to characterize the host responses. On the left is an example of sequencing single antigen specific B cells. Um, Jim Crow and others from Vanderbilt have uh, developed a, a very rapid pipeline of rapidly isolating and profiling a diverse panel of human monoclonal antibodies targeting the spike protein. And in this table, you can see that PEC biosmart sequencing is used and then Sanger as a validation to sequence the light and heavy chain uh, in tandem, uh, giving you that information. On the right, you see an example of deep mutational scanning that was um, applied by Jesse Bloom and others from the University of Washington to make to uh, apply PEC bio to characterize a library of a large number of all the possible mutant variants and the PEC biosequencing is used to link those mutants with a particular barcode that can then be used in, uh, for example, yeast display systems to express and to functionally interrogate these large libraries, thereby having a massively parallel assay to functionally understand uh, the response to the virus. And uh, Jesse has applied this method to now a large number of different aspects. Here's just a few papers on the bottom right, a science paper, uh, prospectively mapping viral mutations that escape antibodies used to treat COVID-19, um, looking at complete maps of these uh, mutations that um, uh, again in escape and, and vaccine uh, responses. So this is a powerful method to really have high throughput methods to understand the biology of the virus and how it interacts with the host immune system. So to summarize, we believe that PEC bio hi-fi sequencing is a very a powerful technology for number one, enabling robust pathogen surveillance, but also for conducting COVID related research. And while today's focus is on detecting and tracking COVID-19 in our communities, the infrastructure that's being developed and the research that's uh, being uh, conducted will bode very well for our preparedness and sophistication of fighting COVID-19 and other pathogens in the future. So getting smarter, on understanding the impact of COVID variants on vaccine responses, patient prognosis, and then longer term to quickly identify what pathogen is responsible for respiratory infection, what strain it is, whether it is bacterial, viral, something known or something new uh, will be possible. And so we look forward to continuing to work with the scientific community of implementing these solutions. And if you're interested, please reach out to us um, uh, and there's also the website for our COVID landing page here.